Chapter One of King and Parliament, A.D. 1603 to 1714. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. King and Parliament, A.D. 1603 to 1714, by George Henry Wakeling. Introduction. The Middle Ages had ended in England amid the storm and stress of the Wars of the Roses. Wearied out by thirty years of bloodshed on the battlefield and the scaffold, the English nation threw itself at the feet of Henry the Seventh and craved of him naught but strong governance and the end of anarchy. It was on these terms that he and his progeny ruled England. But the Tudors had a shrewd perception of the truth that Englishmen are more easily led than driven. They were tyrannical to many individuals who resisted their will in things secular or religious, but to the majority they represented that majesty and security which we now describe as the state. For while they maintained strict law and order in the land, as is the first duty of every government, they studiously avoided collisions with the prejudices and feelings of the nation. The result was that during the 16th century Englishmen developed a new spirit. It was not quite a spirit of liberty. We are accustomed nowadays to a freedom in our actions and opinions which was quite unknown then. If a man spoke or wrote or even thought differently from his fellows in Tudor times, he was suspected of disloyalty. There had been so much anarchy and division during the civil wars of the previous century that an absence of disagreement was felt to be the all-important thing. The king and his government must be obeyed without criticism. Religion was not, as now, a matter for each man to choose for himself without interference. The government could not afford to let men obey their own consciences. A Roman Catholic was an enemy of the nation, because he believed in the Pope's authority rather than in the King's. A Puritan was suspected of disloyalty because he placed his own ideas before the law of the land. No one could be loyal both to Pope and King. Many had to choose between law and conscience. The slightest criticism of any matter in church or state was considered the forerunner of rebellion. If the Tudors gave England peace and order, they expected in return unquestioning obedience. The nation was to be one in thought and belief, for only so could it be one in action. It was thus that Englishmen learned to feel that they were one, and the sixteenth century gave us a national spirit. It was shown in many ways. Men like Raleigh felt sure that nature intended Englishmen to fight Spaniards. Men like Richard Grenville expressed their joy that they never turned their backs on Don or Devil yet. Shakespeare transplanted into the tale of the Lancastrian reigns a fire and a patriotism which really belonged to his own day. But the real source of this spirit was the change in religion. The Reformation had a profound effect upon England as a nation and upon the separate individuals who composed it. It taught Englishmen to believe in their independence and freedom from the interference of the Bishop of Rome. This was at the bottom of the great national feeling of which we have spoken. But men also learnt that since they were responsible to God for their own acts and words, they must learn to think for themselves. This was an entirely different feeling. It made each man believe in himself. It may be called the personal spirit. Now the Tudors wished to have the national spirit without this personal one. The first would help to secure reverence for their government, for men would see in the monarch the embodiment of that free orderly nation which was for the future to depend upon itself. But the second was considered dangerous. It might lead men to question the sovereign's right to decide religion as it had led them to question the Pope's right. Now this is exactly what happened. This personal spirit led men into a new religious belief. 
when in the latter half of the sixteenth century the church of england as established by law in elizabeth's day failed to satisfy some earnest thinkers they adopted the extreme opinions of the continental protestants this new religious force was called in derision puritanism the men who held it wished to purify the church of all that reminded them of a hated popish past of bishops of ceremonies and ritual even of sacraments elizabeth while relaxing wherever possible the bonds of discipline yet refused to allow to individual consciences any departure from the church system she had established either in the direction of roman catholicism or of the advanced protestantism of the continent so the puritans were punished for not conforming to the national church no less than were the roman catholics some obeyed and accepted the prayer-book and episcopacy others shook the dust of england from their feet and went abroad thus there were two new spirits or forces in the land which must some day become antagonistic to each other the national and the personal spirit the tudor government had set itself to use the first and curb the second at the beginning of the seventeenth century therefore england needed a great man and there was a great work for him to do when a nation becomes strong and united the time for absolute government is past a monarch may act for a people when they are disunited and discipline them when they quarrel but he must act with them when they have learned the lesson of unity they will then require some share in their own government some right to advise or choose they will refuse to be told what they are to do and believe as if they were still unable to act and think for themselves it is always a slow movement from the one form of government to the other and at the crisis it needs a man who possesses the nation's confidence to lead it steadily along the path of toleration and self-government such a leader must believe in the nation no less than in himself the crisis had now arrived and unfortunately for england the stuart kings who now sat upon the throne of the tudors were quite unfitted for the task they believed in themselves and not in the nation they thought they had a personal mission to govern and consequently treated opposition and criticism as impudence and ignorance no doubt they had a good deal of both to encounter but the new rulers were unable to discern that underneath the opposition and prejudices there lay that spirit which has been the making of all great nations james i and charles i wished to work on tudor principles and failed to understand that they had to deal with a people which had already spent a sufficient number of years in the nursery nor were these kings prepared to work with the nation and take it as it was they believed they possessed a divine hereditary right a right endorsed by their own wisdom and abilities sanctioned by the personal power allowed to past kings and upheld by their family tree they did not comprehend that the sovereign power which all efficient governments must possess will only be respected by those who approve its work and can understand its methods so they drew a line between themselves and the nation and thus destroyed that mutual understanding which had supported the tudor government while the tyrant henry the eighth had often taken his parliaments into his confidence king james or king charles were always careful to remind the two houses that they and their sovereign could never treat as equals thus the union of king and people which the tudors had fostered the stuarts neglected but the nation had learned the lesson and believed in it when the good-natured laziness of james i and the conceit of his son charles allowed the national feeling to be wounded by arrogant spanish ambassadors and subservient royal chaplains resistance was aroused at once in contemning the national spirit these kings aroused the personal one the puritan one roman catholicism was still to most englishmen the evil one in disguise and when the stuarts refused to see it in that light yet condescended to give no reasons for toleration puritan politicians were exasperated while puritan divines and pamphleteers wrote enthusiastic and wearisome tracts to prove that england was pledged to the continental form of protestantism 
high church clergymen were rewarded by royal favour for preaching and writing that the king was above the law and could be neither criticised nor resisted and the puritans answered by combining their resistance to ecclesiastical innovations with a passionate claim for the supremacy of parliament over the royal power thus the religious and the political opposition were merged in one the struggle that ensued became a battle for sovereignty that is for the supreme and final power in the state both parties claimed divine sanction for their religious programme and each wished the state to enforce it the king and a majority of the churchmen combined to resist the claims of the parliament and the puritans the parliament and the puritans combined to dispute the king's right to lay down the law in church and state thus the opposition though it claimed to be national was really inspired by that personal spirit which claimed the right to think for itself in matters political as well as in matters religious men began to teach that the real duty of a government was to get at the mind of the nation and carry out its will rather than to dictate what was to be done and believed now the question of sovereignty was one on which it was useless to appeal to former practice for there were enough precedents in church and state to justify both parties each accused the other of innovation or departure from custom and each claimed the conservative position so dear to englishmen the king said that the claims of parliament to a share in the sovereign power were unheard of as indeed they were if tudor times were the test archbishop laud thought the puritan idea of a strict observance of the sabbath was unheard of which until very recent years it certainly was on the other hand parliament considered that the king's claim to be above the law was unheard of and on medieval precedents this too was true the puritans urged that the ceremonies they were told to observe were innovations and for many years this also was true the solution of the religious dispute was a gradual extension of freedom and thought and action but for this neither party was as yet prepared the solution of the political dispute was a gradual change in the form of government from one in which the king commanded and the nation chafed into one in which the government was responsible to parliament while parliament was responsible to the electors the struggle wore on till it ended in war which did not bring a settlement of the question not till the end of the century was toleration begun in practice and the law finally placed above the king but by the time of william the third the cabinet responsible to parliament which carries on a national government in accordance with national wishes was not far distant when england had learnt that the majority of men in a civilized nation cannot be permanently excluded from a share in its government the goal to which the struggles of the seventeenth century had been pointed was reached it is our own fault to-day if we cannot trust each other in religious questions and trust our elected government in national questions. End of chapter 1james stuart the successor of elizabeth on the english throne was the son of the famous mary queen of scots he had been king in scotland almost from his birth on his accession to the crown of the triple kingdom henceforth called great britain and ireland he was thirty-seven years old his position in scotland had been one of great difficulty largely owing to the presbyterian clergy whose constant officious interference with him had grafted in his mind a firm belief in the merits of an episcopal church dependent upon the crown james was acute in his own limited way learned and good-humoured but his character was fatally marred by conceit obstinacy and indecision his uncouth manners and ungainly person rendered absurd his claim to be considered a supernaturally gifted king the british solomon as he loved to be called 
an honest belief in his own abilities and good intentions is always a source of weakness to a man who has little power of work and less appreciation of difficulties james was and remained without a policy though a policy was imperatively necessary for one who had to deal with the two great questions which elizabeth had left unsolved the question of sovereignty of the state and the question of toleration in the church the first ten years of his reign are marked by constant little failures which are hardly retrieved by the absence of any great mistakes the king failed to keep in touch with his first parliament which lasted from sixteen o four to sixteen ten as completely as he showed himself unable to solve the increasing religious difficulties caused by the rise of the puritans in ireland and scotland attempts at a statesmanlike policy were thwarted by the royal obstinacy but in foreign matters where in after days james was apt to flounder more than in domestic he was kept from serious harm by the wisdom of his first minister robert cecil earl of salisbury the attitude of the parliament toward the king was from the beginning ominous of troubles to come the commons stated in the form of apology 1604 that their privileges were their right not derived as james thought from the royal grace this strong language was occasioned by his attack upon the right of the lower house to decide disputed elections nor did the leader spare hints that the dangers of elizabeth's reign had kept the parliamentary demands more moderate than they were likely to be in future the king merely replied that they should use their liberty with more modesty the complete union of england with scotland was one of james's dearest projects but the english were jealous of scots and the matter was finally dropped because there was no agreement as to how it should be managed parliament wished to have a share in effecting it by legally naturalizing scotchmen this the king thought was accomplished by the mere fact of his accession an appeal to the judges produced the decision that a child born in scotland since sixteen o three was not an alien and further than this the king who had the best intentions in the matter was unable to go in religion which was likely to prove the greatest crux of all there were three parties those orthodox anglicans who conformed to the prayer book and the church system of elizabeth the obstinate few who remained true to roman catholicism and the puritans who had been persecuted by elizabeth but hoped for better times under the new regime the roman catholics were menaced by many laws passed in the late reign which made the exercise of their religion high treason they were also liable to fines for not attending their parish churches the former are called the penal laws the later recusancy fines james did not share the bitter feeling which had prompted these laws and would fain have put an end to all religious quarrels a noble aim but not a practical one in an age when the popes still looked upon england as probably reclaimable to the dominion of the roman see parliament spoke the voice of the majority of englishmen when it demanded the enforcement of these cruel laws their attitude was strengthened by the wild attempt of some fanatical papists to sweep away king and commons alike by the horrible gunpowder treason in 1605 these eager spirits their chiefs were catesby winter fox and digsby formed the gunpowder plot the houses of parliament were to be blown up during a sitting at which the king and the prince of wales were present by means of gunpowder placed in the cellars beneath it was discovered through a letter in which one of the conspirators endeavoured to hint to his friend the danger of attending parliament on november fifth after the execution of guy fox and others persecution fell more stringently on the catholics for the nation suspected that they had all been implicated in the plot and wished to exterminate the whole sect meantime the puritans were far from satisfied in the millinery petition presented to the king very shortly after his arrival in england sixteen o three they had asked for some alterations in the ceremonies to which all ministers had to conform james arranged a conference between bishops and puritan divines at hampton court 
but there were great difficulties in the way of making the church wide enough to contain these men who wished to modify the thirty-nine articles and to grant all presbyters a share in the episcopal power the high churchmen opposed all such changes james himself had a wholesome dread of the introduction of the scottish system the only result of the conference was that some canons were drawn up in sixteen o four binding clergy and laity still more strictly to the prayer book for the time the parliamentary protests against this attitude of church and crown were in vain but when james showed a disposition to side strongly with church against state in matters of law and proposed to settle the vexed question of the jurisdiction of church courts by hearing cases himself he was led into a serious quarrel with chief justice cook the lawyer plainly told him that the royal power was official rather than personal and that the law was above it such a doctrine was anything but agreeable to one who held with divine hereditary right taxation was another point on which james was soon at issue with his subjects the king's income was not sufficient for the needs of government as well as those of an extravagant court whose officials made money at the nation's expense parliament was not liberal to a king with whom they so seldom agreed and james relying on precedents in the late reign took upon himself to increase the import duties without consulting parliament such impositions had been made illegal in edward the third's reign but the judges decided in the case of bate 1606 that the king could increase or vary such taxes by his prerogative or royal power alone this was the first of a long series of cases during the century in which the king appealed to the bench for a confirmation of his rights james's first parliament closed its seven years duration with a quarrel over another financial difficulty the great contract was a scheme by which the crown should renounce the antiquated feudal payments due from land in return for a fixed annual sum this finally failed for the commons required as a preliminary satisfaction about impositions and church courts it was of little use for men like bacon to hope that king and parliament would work together for reform and progress each was in fact beginning to claim for itself a discretionary power to act somewhat beyond the existing law the tudor plan of doing what was necessary was losing credit in the face of the further question of what was right and it is certain that a man like james put a great strain on the idea that kings govern because they know best meanwhile ireland had its own set of difficulties and problems the irish rebellion of fifteen ninety eight had been pitilessly crushed and in sixteen o four sir a chichester undertook the government of ireland there were two chief difficulties land and religion the native irish looked on protestantism as a foreign creed forced on them against their will the lord deputy tried conciliatory measures and hoped to educate the irish in the change of faith but the irish parliament of sixteen thirteen proved as intractable as the english and james foolishly recalled chichester of whose moderate policy he had not approved the agrarian difficulty which chichester had proposed to solve by abolishing the ancient irish custom by which the whole tribe held the tribal lands in common tenure and making the natives free tenants led to a wholesale eviction of the latter and the colonization of ulster by english and scotch settlers on the continent the government had inherited from elizabeth a policy of war with spain but as spain was no longer dangerous james and cecil wisely made peace in sixteen o four there was however a feeling in england that something should be done for the netherlands that is the countries we now call belgium and holland the northern or dutch provinces had recently thrown off the yoke of spain while the southern or belgian had by cruel persecutions been kept back in their servitude james was in fact induced in sixteen o nine to guarantee on behalf of the northern provinces a treaty by which they obtained a twelve years truce from philip the third but he refused to be dragged into a war against spain in their interest he also allied himself with henry the fourth of france and with the protestant princes in germany 
marrying his daughter Elizabeth to the Protestant elector Frederick of the Palatinate. Such was the policy of Cecil, who died in 1612. With his death, following on that of Henry IV, and of James's hopeful son, Prince Henry, the chances of a successful foreign policy came to an end. From 1612 to 1619, James fell from bad to worse. Finding that Parliament could not be moulded to his will, he came to rely on favourites who moulded him to theirs. He opened an intrigue with Spain and became a tool in the hands of its quick-witted ambassador, Sarmiento, Count of Gondomar. He adopted Bacon's fatal theory that the judges should be lions under the throne, that is, the king's tools, and dismissed the chief justice who objected to be made the exponent of this experiment in natural history. He trampled on the Scottish church, quarreled with the Dutch, and so lost touch with his people that when a national question arose in the last period of his reign he was unable to avoid disaster. A Scotchman named Robert Carr, upon whom James lavished titles and favours, was now his chief adviser. He had been made Viscount Rochester, and shortly became Earl of Somerset. The Spanish party at court and the Spanish ambassador Sarmiento used this favourite to further their policy. The alliance with France had failed after the three deaths before mentioned, and the efforts of Spain were now directed to replace it by a closer friendship with the court of Madrid. The Spaniards had a delusion that Protestantism was merely an English fad which might be removed with patience and care. James's own idea was expressed in the words Beati Pacifici. He loved to dream of himself as the peacemaking arbiter of a docile Europe. But he failed to see that Spain liked peace for other reasons, that she did not want England to help the Dutch, and was only trying to win toleration for the Catholics, fondly dreaming of the complete conversion of England to crown her castle in the air. The financial needs of the government caused a parliament to be summoned in 1614, but the new assembly refused to supply the royal needs unless it could obtain some satisfaction about impositions, which had been largely increased since the case of Bate. The Spanish party suggested that a marriage of Prince Charles, now heir to the English throne, with the wealthy Infanta Maria, daughter of Philip III, would settle James's debts, and the king, relying on the kindly feelings of the Spanish ambassador, dissolved Parliament after two months. Digby, afterwards Earl of Bristol, was entrusted with negotiations of a vague character for the Spanish match. He was able and honest, too honest to be on a level with the Spanish diplomatists. The obstinacy and consequent dissolution of Parliament soon caused another return to arbitrary taxation by royal mandate. This took the form of a benevolence or free gift, but the gift was in truth so little free that a man named Oliver St. John was prosecuted in the Star Chamber for refusing to contribute. This court, the king's favorite engine, was extremely powerful because exempt from the ordinary rules of judicial procedure. It had been very effectual in suppressing disorder in Tudor times, and was now composed of the members of the Privy Council, who were thus able to punish those who resisted the royal authority. It was practically the ministry sitting as unfettered judge of its own acts. It was not long before the Crown gained a further ally in the subservient bench. Chief Justice Cook had an exaggerated opinion of the importance of the lawyers, but his belief in the law was a useful weapon against a king who claimed to be irresponsible. He disagreed with Bacon's idea and considered that the judges should be arbiters in the state, a view which would only suit James so long as they arbitrated in his favor. When, therefore, Cook asserted his duty as a judge to act, not on the king's orders, but as the law dictated, he was dismissed, 1616. Bacon became chancellor soon after this, and the Stuarts had little further trouble from independent judges. The Dutch were driving James further in the direction of a Spanish alliance by disputing the English monopoly of whale-fishing, and excluding them from trade with the Spice Islands in the East Indies. But the arrogance of Somerset was unbearable. 
and his anti-Spanish opponents were already undermining his monopoly of the king's favour by teaching a handsome, clever youth named Villiers to attract the king's notice. At this moment, the Spanish conditions of marriage were announced, and as they included a suspension of the penal laws and a Catholic education for the future heir to the throne, the hopes of the opposite party revived. Their triumph appeared even more sure after a scandalous lawsuit in which Somerset and his wife were pronounced guilty of poisoning a courtier named Overbury, who had known some damaging facts about the divorce of Lady Somerset from her first husband. James, however, was not easily diverted from his hankering after Spain. He feared the nation's feeling might develop into a war cry, and apparently thought he could allay their prejudices by selling their laws and opinions. The enemies of Spain had now found a ready weapon in the old Elizabethan sea captain Sir Walter Raleigh. He had been in prison for twelve years for supposed complicity in a plot against the king, but he was still eager to sail to the Orinoco and discover a mine of gold, of which he had heard in former voyages. James allowed him to go, though the Spaniards cried out against the scheme as an infringement of the unlimited rights which they claimed in the West Indies. Raleigh, though warned not to trespass on these rights, started with no intention of keeping so impossible a promise. After an unsuccessful voyage in which his men fought with Spanish settlers and burnt San Tomé, he returned to find the king pledged to hand him over to Spain. The disgrace was avoided, but Raleigh was sacrificed to Spanish hatred and executed in 1618 on the old charge of treason which had kept him so many years in the tower. The new favorite, George Villiers, had now become the king's trusted adviser as Duke of Buckingham, but did not at once throw in his lot with the Spanish party. This, and the fact that the Infanta and her dowry could not be obtained without complete toleration of the Roman Catholics, caused a suspension of the marriage scheme. But the king, though he ceased for the time to bargain for the sale of the conscience of England, showed but scant respect for that of Scotland. He called an assembly at Perth in 1618, which was forced to adopt five articles, prescribing rites and ceremonies to which the Scottish clergy and people strongly objected. It is to be noticed, however, that James never went so far as his less prudent son, and made no attempt to enforce uniformity of worship in his two kingdoms. Meanwhile, the European horizon grew dark with the great shadow of the Thirty Years' War. This struggle began in Bohemia in the year 1618 and aroused the national feeling in a way that made it more than ever necessary that there should be a leader with clear aims and the confidence of his people. But the last period of the reign from 1618 to 1625 presents a pitiable spectacle a helpless king drifting aimlessly amid a sea of conflicting interests without a policy which he dared to explain to the nation was content to seek for guidance from the bitterest enemy of the nation spain the struggles which had begun during the last century between protestants and catholics in germany had been compromised but not settled there were german princes pledged to each side and each prince claimed to regulate the religion of his subjects but latitude and longitude cannot really determine opinion, and if they could, it would be hard to settle what was to be done when a ruler held sway over many lands of varying opinion. This was the difficulty which had now occurred. The emperor Matthias, when dealing with his Bohemian subjects, was obliged to allow both religions. The claims of Protestants to build churches on Catholic church lands led to the destruction of one of their places of worship, and the Protestants at once rebelled. The rest of Germany was composed of states interested in one side or the other, but before much could happen, the emperor died, and the Bohemians took the opportunity of refusing to accept his successor, the bigoted Ferdinand II. In August of 1619 they elected James's son-in-law, Frederick of the Palatinate, as their king. James believed in his family far more than in his country, and was anxious to prevent the loss of his son-in-law's domain on the Rhine, which would probably follow should Ferdinand be successful in Bohemia. 
but he believed even more in himself and so he began to study the question of bohemian rights while the time for action slipped away james had two choices he might mediate or he might fight for the latter alternative he had a thorough dislike and he was certainly wise in not wishing to embroil england in continental quarrels for the sake of a man like frederick this prince was proud and incapable and went to prague only to see his cause overthrown by the imperial forces in october of sixteen twenty but if james would mediate he had a fair chance spain though connected by her royal family and religion with the emperor ferdinand was not at all eager to fight for the catholic cause as she was shortly expecting a renewal of her war with the dutch the protestant princes were not anxious to see their religion trampled on and the palatinate transferred from frederick to the duke of bavaria which was the emperor's intention france too was bound to be jealous of austro-spanish success thus there was an opportunity both to defend the palatinate in force and to mediate in the matter of bohemia while james was studying the question the palatinate was seized thus the clever gondomar had gained his object james had relied on the high opinion he always held of spanish kindness and buckingham had at last thrown in his lot with spain when the affairs of the nation had got quite beyond their control the stuarts generally summoned a parliament and in sixteen twenty one james pursued this course here was a good opportunity to put himself at the head of his people he spoke of money which he needed to enable him to mediate sword in hand but as he did not explain his intentions further no money was voted the truth was he had no plans to explain parliament attacked the trade monopolies which were sold to courtiers demanded the execution of the penal laws on the papists and begged the king to fight spain and marry his son to a protestant while the commons were showing the intensity of their feeling by cruelly punishing a roman catholic named floyd for expressing pleasure at the defeat of frederick james and buckingham were hoping to get back the palatinate by the old delusion of the spanish marriage the king first promised gondomar not to allow parliament to offend the religious feeling of spain and then promised the houses not to conclude any treaties which would be disadvantageous to the religion of england when the commons refused to leave the matter to the care of the king and the spanish ambassador they were told not to meddle with mysteries of state this with a further declaration that their power to discuss national interests was derived from the royal grace caused them to protest that their liberties were their birthright the protest was torn from the journals by the angry monarch's own hand and the third parliament of king james was dissolved meanwhile the war in germany went on the protestant cause was in the hands of a reckless soldier of fortune named mansfield who was alienating friends by plundering and slaying the peasants of the rhine districts the protestant union gave up the struggle and the saving of the elector's cause was rendered hopeless when heidelberg his capital fell in september of sixteen twenty two the intervention of spain on which james had relied was as far off as ever and the spaniards having now secured their object were inclined to finish the negotiations by pleading the impossibility of obtaining the pope's assent to the marriage at home james was without a single wise counsellor digby was in spain trying to construct a policy out of spanish politeness and his master's fears bacon the lord chancellor had fallen a victim to his own carelessness in accepting presents which can only have been meant as bribes and was in disgrace buckingham and the prince over whose weak character the quick and reckless favourite had complete influence now determined to go to spain and arrange the marriage themselves james was induced to assent to this absurd scheme but his council preferred to send an ultimatum to spain asking whether philip would fight the emperor to force the restitution of the palatinate this brought a deceptive reply but it showed the spaniards that their game was nearly played out the situation when the travellers reached madrid was remarkable the king philip the fourth and his ministers as well as the infanta herself were all in reality averse to the match james never meant to promise the repeal of the penal laws 
and the spaniards never meant to take less charles imagined that he was in love as soon as he saw the princess while buckingham offended all the spaniards he could offend in the short time given him the pope refused to be made the cause of a rupture of which the spaniards meant him to bear the blame and philip the fourth found it impossible to propose any terms which charles was not foolish enough to accept even after bargaining to obtain a repeal of the penal laws in three years the prince still failed to carry off the prize and left madrid in a fit of ill temper when he was home again his pride outweighed his affections and he called for vengeance on the spaniards he was still pledged to the marriage but it was now england's turn to raise the terms and philip was asked to arm against his family and his religion to secure a restitution of the palatinate the dilemma was in fact so hopeless that another parliament was summoned for february sixteen twenty four buckingham and charles were able to pose as national heroes who had burst the chains riveted by spain to fetter english freedom the treaties were dissolved and money voted but the chance of acting with parliament speedily vanished buckingham now became anxious for an alliance with france the old foe of spain and wished to secure the hand of a french princess for charles parliament was more than ever determined to keep to the penal laws and in foreign affairs to renew the work of elizabeth and smite spain by sea and land the king of england was thinking only of the palatinate and was as willing to rely on french charity as on spanish but hated all idea of a religious war the french were delighted to see spain injured but cared nothing for the palatinate since they were only bent on recovering the valteline the alpine valley by which the spaniards had an access to germany from the mediterranean nor was france sufficiently in need of the english alliance to waive her claim for toleration of roman catholics in england the result of this confusion was soon apparent james having given a clear promise to parliament not to repeal the penal laws thought he could still write a secret engagement with france by which the roman catholics were promised toleration the marauder mansfield was hired to lead english troops to recover the palatinate but when they crossed the sea they were left to die in hundreds of cold and hunger on the dutch frontiers the marriage treaty with france however was duly signed and the french king was promised assistance against his rebellious protestant subjects while buckingham who still retained the unmerited confidence of the nation won on his return from spain was thus unwittingly concocting a series of national disgraces the king died on march twenty seventh sixteen twenty five he was only in his sixtieth year but his unhealthy habits and hard drinking had made him old and decrepit long before his time End of chapter two chapter three of king and parliament by george henry wakeling this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the reign of charles i to the meeting of the long parliament sixteen twenty five to sixteen forty from the accession of the second stuart king in sixteen twenty five until the meeting in sixteen forty of the parliament which was to arm half england against him there are three well-marked periods till sixteen twenty nine there is a constant struggle with three successive parliaments which refuse to finance the kaleidoscopic foreign policy of the king and buckingham from sixteen twenty nine to sixteen thirty seven the rule of the king was absolute he summoned no parliaments he taxed as he pleased he legislated by proclamation he bent the judges to his will and gave archbishop laud carte blanche to mould the church to the extreme high church and anti-puritan model while strafford in ireland reproduced on a smaller scale the same tyrannical form of government the nation seemed quiet and all fear of resistance to the stuart methods appeared to be at an end when scotland rose in rebellion in defence of its religion the three years struggle that ensued completed the period 
In 1640 there was no hope for Charles but in an English Parliament, and on November 3rd the long struggle began for the sovereignty of England. The new king was married to Henrietta Maria, sister of Louis XIII of France, in June of 1625, but her influence was at first slight compared to that of Buckingham. Charles was a prince of a quiet and sober disposition. He possessed all the private virtues and was an enlightened friend of art and letters, but he had learnt only too well his father's doctrine of the infallibility of kings, and he was so obstinate and so convinced of his own good intentions that he scarcely understood the necessity of saying exactly what he meant and meaning exactly what he said his word could never be depended upon he was easily led into a sudden action and easily amazed when he was committed to it thus his policy at home and abroad was marked by impulse rather than by thoughtfulness he disliked intolerance but used it when it suited any policy which he had in hand Indeed, he seems to have thought that even deception was a fair weapon to gain ends which he believed to be just. Yet he was a loving husband and father, a hard-working man of business, and a fairly staunch supporter of his friends. His greatest fault as a king lay in the fact that he did not in the least understand men. He considered that all those who disagreed with him must be wicked rather than mistaken, and must be forced to see things in the right light. The same fatal flaw was in his friend and adviser William Laud, whom he made Archbishop of Canterbury in 1633. Sir Thomas Wentworth, afterwards Earl of Strafford, who, after a brief resistance to the court and Parliament, joined the King's party because he found himself out of his element among Puritan members, was a third believer in the necessity of carrying through the opinions he held, no matter what resistance was offered, a method which he called the policy of thorough. These were the three men who were soon to exasperate England and bring Scotland and Ireland to open rebellion, not because they wished to harm any one, but because they did not know how to lead men who refused to be driven. Before his first Parliament met, Charles and his favourite were resolved to fight Spain, but Louis of France was quite unwilling to give any active help and england besides engaging in a new spanish war was also pledged to assist the dutch pay large sums to mansfield and subsidize the danish king who was now posing as the champion of protestantism in germany the first parliament showed its distrust of the king to none of whose confidences it was admitted by refusing to vote a tax on imports and exports known as tonnage and poundage which had for centuries been granted to kings on their accession as a matter of course. Their Puritan sentiments were also outraged by the encouragement of those clergy who openly taught the king's superiority to law and maintained extreme high church doctrines. In the end, the leaders began to single out Buckingham as the chief cause of troubles. This was an attempt to make a royal minister responsible to Parliament, and though there were many precedents for it, Yet it was so opposed to Tudor practice and Stuart theory that Charles dissolved Parliament in the same year. At once the favourite and his master resolved to show their ability by an attack on Spain. They sent out an expedition which sailed into Cadiz harbour in October 1625, but it turned out a complete and disgraceful failure. A second Parliament found this expedition an additional grievance. Sir John Eliot, vice-admiral of devon led the attack and the favourite was impeached this again was more than charles would permit and the houses were dissolved after demanding the dismissal of buckingham as an enemy of church and state the french alliance was becoming too great a strain on charles's temper he was vexed that the ships which he lent to his ally were used against the rebellious french protestants at la rochelle though it was for this very end that louis the thirteenth had borrowed them he was annoyed by the claims of his wife to regulate her household, and he dismissed her French attendants. He was, of course, quite unable to fulfil his promises to tolerate Roman Catholics, and in 1627 a war with France was the natural result. Buckingham started to attack the island of Ray, from which Rochelle was menaced. The expedition, however, proved an even more dismal failure than that of Cadiz, 
and Parliament met in 1628 to present an ever-increasing list of grievances. These now take clear shape. The exaction of forced loans and benevolences, the imprisonment of men by the royal power alone, the billeting of recruits in private houses, and the use of martial law were declared to be against the rights of Englishmen, and Charles, after some attempts at resistance, was compelled to agree to this petition of right. But it was not only in political matters that Parliament was determined to make a stand. They complained bitterly of the Arminians, footnote, so called from Arminius, a Dutchman who led the opposition to Calvinism in Holland, end footnote. This was a name given to Laud and his high church friends who were carrying the king with them in their resistance to Puritanism. They refused to acquiesce in the extreme forms of Protestantism which had been for a long time in force on the continent and to which the Puritans wished to bind the English church. This development of Protestantism was called Calvinism from the French reformer Calvin who had led the movement in the 16th century and whose teachings had been largely accepted in Switzerland and other places. One of his chief tenets was predestination. He taught that God had once for all chosen his elect by his mere will and pleasure, and to the number of those there could be no additions. This was felt by many to be opposed to the idea of a merciful God who called upon men to repent and accept salvation. English churchmen resisted this Calvinism and maintained that the teaching and ceremonies of the English church were to be looked for in her history, and that she could repudiate the errors of Rome without needing the hard teaching of the extreme reformers. But the fact that the churchmen firmly believed that the commons were only resisting the king for their private ends, and were encouraged by royal favor to say as much, complicated the religious difficulty by making it political. In the summer of the year 1628, Buckingham was assassinated at Portsmouth, while preparing an expedition to relieve the Huguenots in Rochelle. An officer named Felton, who grew angry at not getting promotion, brooded over his wrongs and began to attribute them to the man who was spoken of in Parliament as the enemy of his country. He was at last driven by such thoughts to the terrible crime of murdering the hated Duke by stabbing him. The king was thus left to conduct his own government. The way seemed open for a better understanding. Much might have been done now, for the houses would have welcomed any attempt to work with them. Pym, the future parliamentary leader, and Eliot, the future martyr to liberty, were alike anxious to see King and Parliament in harmony. Not a word had been said against Charles personally. Even a Puritan writer who did not scruple to describe the bishops as knobs and wens and bunchy popish flesh had a kind word for the good harmless king. But Charles was dogmatically sure of his path, and insisted on his right to levy tonnage and poundage without grant, holding that it was not included in his renunciation of gifts, loans, taxes, or benevolences in the petition of right. The leaders of the house encouraged merchants to refuse payment. They were also thoroughly alarmed at innovations in religion and determined to put their case before the country. Three resolutions were passed declaring those who introduced religious innovations, paid tonnage and poundage, or exacted it, to be enemies of the country. The speaker who wished to abscond was meanwhile held in the chair by excited Puritan members, and the doors locked to prevent the dissolution which they knew to be imminent, and which followed as a matter of course. The king now determined to rule without Parliament, and for eleven years he managed to get along somehow without one. Elliot and others were imprisoned for their recent action in the house, and the judges were induced to refuse them liberty unless they acknowledged their fault and promised amendment. This was refused by some, and Elliot died in prison three years later. Peace had, of course, to be made with France and Spain, 1630, and though Charles had a fine opportunity for recovering the Palatinate, he was obliged to refuse it. Gustavus Adolphus, king of Sweden, the greatest warrior of the age, carried all before him in Germany. But the English king had no power to back him, and the Protestant champion fell on the field of Lützen in 1632. 
yet Charles was not inclined to abandon his sister's cause. In 1633 he returned to his father's feudal hope and actually allied with Spain against the Dutch in order to get Spanish help in the matter of the Palatinate. He required a fleet and revived an old custom by which maritime counties were obliged to supply ships and money in time of danger. As he dared not announce his Spanish intrigue even to his council, he issued his first writ of ship money in 1634 on the plea that channel pirates must be put down. The fleet sailed about the channel but accomplished nothing, and as France and Holland now combined against Spain, there was small hope of her intervention to secure Charles's family interests in the Palatinate. In 1633, two events of profound import occurred. Wentworth was made Lord Deputy of Ireland, and Laud succeeded Abbott as Archbishop of Canterbury. For seven years Ireland was ruled by a fearless and strong hand. Wentworth knew that it required both. Where I found a church, a crown, and a people spoiled, I could not imagine to redeem them with gracious smiles and gentle looks. It would cost warmer water than so. This was his own account of his prospects, and he certainly followed it out. In a few years he modelled and disciplined a standing army, cleared the coasts of pirates, introduced some manufactures, started the growing of flax, and reformed the church system but he forgot to be careful about the means he used. In order to get land for colonists, he violated some concessions known as the Graces, which had secured the native lords against any possible confiscations. He brushed aside legal and constitutional rules as easily as he crossed the ideas and customs which centuries of use had endeared to the people. His objects were noble, his achievements were great, but his lasting success was nil he won no hearts. What Wentworth sought in Ireland, Laud sought in England, unity by means of enforced uniformity. For both, the lever was the royal power. For both, the watchword was thorough. Laud used the Star Chamber and High Commission Court to force Englishmen into a groove. He spared neither rank nor creed. He wished to punish the immorality of the rich, the nonconformity of the Puritan, and the recusancy of the Roman Catholic. The object, unity, was as noble as Strafford's, but the methods were as fatal to real success. Laud wished to see the Church one in the beauty of holiness, one in belief, one in ceremonial, one in resistance to Romanism. This was impossible. There were good and holy men who were unable to agree with him, and there were also those whose scurrilous language and irreverent ways were a legacy from the fierce struggles of the early days of the Reformation. Some of these ardent Puritans, disappointed at the failure of the millinery petition and Hampton Court Conference, had already left their country to seek a new home where they could worship without interference. These pilgrim fathers sailed in the Mayflower, 1620, to the shores of North America. Here they formed a colony, soon to become the great state of New England. Among those who remained at home there was a feeling that the outward forms to which the archbishop exacted conformity were really a pathway to Rome. Thus men refused to bow at the sacred name, to kneel at holy communion, to use the communion table anywhere but in the center of the church. Though we can now acquit Laud of any desire or intention of being untrue to the national church, there were not wanting signs which led honest men to think otherwise. A papal messenger was long at the court on friendly terms with king and ministers. Roman Catholic converts were sure of the queen's protection, and the chapels of her majesty and the foreign ambassadors were neutral ground. If this was only tolerant, we must not forget that it was also illegal, and to the majority of Englishmen incomprehensible, except on the basis of a deeply laid scheme to restore the church to the pope. Men were imprisoned, whipped, pilloried, and mutilated for libels on the bishops. Of these victims, the best known is Prynne, who had already been punished by the Star Chamber for a book condemning stage plays, which was thought to contain some aspersions on the theatre-loving queen. In 1636, he was a second time pilloried, and the remains of his ears shorn off.
the national feeling was shown by the open sympathy which such men received but there was no sign of a cessation of the system in sixteen thirty five ship money was demanded in a second writ which extended the tax to inland counties and towns the king consulted the judges and published their answer which declared that he could legally order such payment and was the sole judge of the danger which justified such unusual demands but it was clear there was no immediate danger the nation required a defensive system for which parliament might easily have been summoned to pretend that a discretionary power which is necessary in an emergency had become part of the ordinary law of the land was to raise the question whether parliament was more than a name in england the freedom of the nation was at stake in sixteen thirty six a third ship money writ followed and a gentleman of buckinghamshire named john hampton whose contribution was assessed at twenty shillings determined to refuse payment and have the matter tried in a law court his counsel took their stand on ancient laws concluding with an appeal to the petition of right and urged that no man was bound to pay taxes except when granted by parliament the judges however adopted the theory that the king had a right to command since he was the soul of the body politic and by a narrow majority gave judgment for the crown ship money was not the only means taken by charles to fill his coffers and avoid a parliament ancient forest rights were revived and men were fined for infringing them compulsory knighthood a relic of the feudal age was revived and fines demanded for exemption monopolies were granted to companies since a law of sixteen twenty four forbade them to individuals and the customs were collected and increased though as we have seen they had never been granted to charles by parliament yet the king seemed secure in his course there were no newspapers railways or meetings to make the national disgust articulate nothing but a parliament could focus the religious and constitutional opposition to the system of thorough and since the king was determined to avoid all foreign complications there seemed no prospect of such an assembly being summoned the blow which scattered this system came from scotland james had irritated the presbyterians by his bishops and ceremonies but charles did worse he visited scotland in sixteen thirty three and gave the bishops a footing they had never had before they were promoted to political office and the chief power in the scottish parliament this sent even the nobles although they feared and disliked the democratic presbyterian clergy into the arms of the kirk but worse was yet to come laud and his master were determined to unite england with scotland in religion as a step toward complete political union to this end canons which enforced a new prayer book and a ceremonial foreign to the scottish church were prepared in sixteen thirty six charles had already been warned not to import a servitude on this church not practised before but he knew not the meaning of a nation's feelings when in sixteen thirty seven the new service book appeared it was described as the mass in english and a riot occurred in july when it was introduced at st giles in edinburgh charles had at last roused a resistance which was national the scots nobles clergy and people with very few exceptions refused to admit that their religion could be touched except by national assent and they did not need to wait for a parliament to express their meaning for the very nature of presbyterian organization was political each parish had its kirk session whose representatives sat in the provincial synod while the whole church met in a national assembly where laymen and clergymen attended on behalf of every congregation a church so organized could not be tampered with petitions poured in from the parishes commissioners were elected to meet in edinburgh and in sixteen thirty eight a national covenant was ready for signature it pledged the scots to resist all popery and innovations and was signed by high and low an assembly met at glasgow which scouted the king's attempts to check its action and swept away at one blow episcopacy and perth articles charles having no standing army was not ready with the weapons of force he began to temporize his offers to modify the position he had taken up were refused the scots were fully roused would be content with nothing less than an acknowledgment of their absolute freedom in religious matters 
the difficulty before the king was great he had no army no money and no friends the english feeling during the three years of struggle were largely in favour of the scots laud was mobbed in london and a daring hand placarded the royal palace to let the scots knew how to avail themselves of this and more than once appealed to the english nation there were two plans before the king wentworth wrote advising a delay of hostilities fortifying of the border blockading of scottish ports to keep the blue bonnet to his peck of oatmeal and careful training of a force for action in the coming year but this could only be done if money were forthcoming and there was little hope of that the king determined on war the scots were ready they had collected a large force at dunce on the border under a veteran soldier alexander leslie and their historian bailey describes them as constantly preaching praying and drilling puritanism had become the church militant what had the english king with which to meet this enthusiasm he rode to york and on to berwick but the forces which had been got together were both badly disciplined and half-hearted in marked contrast to the rebels a few miles off in june of sixteen thirty nine a verbal treaty was made at berwick in which no real settlement was made and a general assembly and a parliament promised to the scots when these met in august they demanded the abolition of episcopacy and a veto on the king's appointment of commanders in the royal castles charles failing to see that he was expected to play the part of a conquered enemy had once accepted wentworth's proposal to rely on his english parliament after eleven years silence the representatives of england met again in the short parliament april thirteenth sixteen forty they sat for three weeks pym stated the feeling of the nation when he claimed for parliament that position as the soul of the body politic which charles had so long claimed for himself the grievances of eleven years were put forward and discussed the king attempted to rouse enthusiasm against the scots by exhibiting a letter addressed au roi which the latter had perhaps intended to send to the king of france but this seemed a trifle compared to the three writs of ship money parliament was clearly not to be moved to abandon its claims nor would it give the government a penny to fight with and the inevitable dissolution followed on may fifth sixteen forty this time wentworth now earl of strafford wished for no delay he gave his advice at a meeting of the privy council in which he urged the king's right to go on with the war loose and absolved from all rules of government you have an army in ireland he is reported to have added which you may employ here to reduce this kingdom though this speech was to cost him his life which was even now in danger from a terrible disease its import was greater for his country than for himself once more strafford had urged the king to govern england as he had himself been ruling ireland and the conviction that charles meant to do so was to grow until it severed the nation into two hostile camps on august twentieth sixteen forty charles left london and the scots who were again ready to fight for religious independence crossed the border on the same day this time there was no hesitation they forced a march of the tyne at newburn on the twenty eighth and occupied the northern counties the royal army gradually falling back before them the king being without money or means of obtaining a reliable force summoned a great council at york which could only suggest a parliament and a fresh negotiation with the rebel scots at ripon the king agreed to pay the latter eight hundred and fifty pounds a day while they remained in england which they meant to do until they obtained a peace and religious settlement after their own wishes thereupon commissioners were appointed and the negotiations were to be reopened in london strafford's advice had not been followed all classes of englishmen from the peers at york to the prentices in london were at last fully roused while the former urged the necessity of reliance on parliament the latter tore down the posters which proclaimed the scots as rebels it would have been well if the king had now been convinced that no reliance on a man or a theory or a party can enable government to conquer a national spirit which it will not lead but this was a lesson charles never learnt though his failure has taught it to succeeding ages End of chapter three Chapter 4 of King and Parliament by George Henry Wakeling. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. From the meeting of the Long Parliament to the commencement of the Civil War, November 3, 1640, to August 22, 1642. When the Long Parliament met on November 3, 1640, there was among its members no clear plan of action and certainly no idea of rebellion. There was an almost universal feeling in favor of a thorough reform, not of the Constitution, but of that which contemporaries call the state of the kingdom. But it was to be done with the king and not despite him. King and people, it was said, needed each other, and reciprocation is the strongest union. The interest of the first period is to watch the collapse of this noble ideal as soon as it became evident that the two conditions, trust and mutual understanding, were wanting. The first object was to vindicate law and restore the rights of Parliament. We are assembled to do God's business and the King's, said a foremost speaker. This meant doing away with Strafford's influence and Laud's power. Accordingly, they were both impeached, together with others who were responsible for arbitrary acts. This challenge to the power above the law was marked by the release of Prynne and others imprisoned by the Star Chamber and High Commission Court. The Triennial Act, providing that a Parliament should meet even without a royal summons after three years had elapsed since it last sat, was then passed. The trial of Stratford was delayed till March of 1641. He was accused of an intention to upset the rule of law and replace it by arbitrary government. Besides many acts and sayings in Ireland and in his northern presidency, alleged against him to prove this, there was his speech in the Privy Council in which he was accused of telling the king to govern as he thought best, there being an army in Ireland which could be used against this kingdom. Now this kingdom might mean Scotland, which was then in rebellion, but it might also mean England, and the Commons felt sure it did. It was difficult to prove that the acts of which he was accused were treasonable, for they were not in any way directed against the king, and the law knew nothing of any other treason. The expression of an opinion might, as Strafford urged, make a heretic, but not a traitor, and the two witnesses required by law to depose their knowledge to treasonable acts were not forthcoming unless, indeed, a surreptitious copy made by the younger vein of the notes taken by his father, a member of the Privy Council at the fatal sitting, could be reckoned a sufficient second witness. The Commons began to fear that the Lords would not condemn Strafford, and therefore substituted a bill of attainder. Footnote. An impeachment is a trial before the Lords, in which the accused has his chance of defending himself. An attainder is a mere declaratory bill, stating that the accused has committed treason and shall be punished for it. End footnote. This only required a majority of opinion that Stratford was a traitor, and thus shifted the question from a legal to a political one. The Commons held a noble theory of treason. Treason which is against the kingdom is more against the king than that which is against his person. But this was not law some of them claimed to be above the law in such a crisis. They were beginning to learn that the theory of divine right was double-edged, and might be claimed by parliaments no less than by kings. The bill was passed, and the lords were induced to accept it by various rumors, not without foundation, that the king's party was tampering with the army in the north. Charles signed it. It was the meanest moment in his life, and gave away the life of his faithful servant though he had pledged his word to Strafford for his safety. But Charles was influenced by mobs without and by casuistry within. The former threatened the lives of those he held dearest, while the latter taught him to regard his duty as a king as unconnected with his promise as a man. Strafford died on Tower Hill, May 12, 1641. At the same time a bill was passed that this Parliament should not be dissolved without its own consent. This exceptional guarantee for its political stability was necessary if Parliament was to regain its position after eleven years of non-existence. The ground for a reformed system of law and government was further cleared by the abolition of the Star Chamber, the High Commission Court, and other extra-legal courts in Wales and the North. 
the most sacred principle of the old constitution was vindicated by the reversal of the hampton judgment on ship money and by a clear surrender of the royal claim to take customs without parliamentary consent charles now appeared to have given in and the reform seemed to complete but at this moment he announced his intention of going to scotland which might mean further intrigues with the army pym and the leaders saw this would not add to the harmony upon which the new state of things depended and cleverly united the lords and commons who had shown signs of disagreement by the production of a document called the ten propositions these asked the king to disband the irish and english armies to delay his journey and to put his affairs in the hands of those whom parliament could trust for the moment however little notice was taken of this motion and when charles departed for scotland in august of sixteen forty one a suspicious but still united parliament was left behind him suspicion was to increase unity to diminish so far the parliament had been completely successful both in clearing the ground of the instruments of arbitrary government and in consolidating their own position law had been restored and the legislature vindicated but the supreme object reform with the king had failed for he was not in touch with the parliamentary leaders and it was clear that they must base their further progress on support outside their walls for this the ground was already prepared but it involved the danger of a split among themselves to understand this we must go back and trace the gradual formation in parliament of a church party prepared to resist the puritan extremes which pym allowed to his followers this is of vast importance for though there was now no court party to be reckoned with any violent action inspired by puritanism would rouse a church party which would sooner trust the king than allow the church to be pulled down early in the session there was an animated debate on a petition to abolish episcopacy some wishing to consider it others while willing to modify the power of the bishops being averse to any idea of abolishing the office a root and branch party pledged to destroy episcopacy was thus face to face with men like hyde and culpepper who were opposed to such extremes quite as much as to arbitrary government the commons had issued a commission to deface and demolish crucifixes and images while the house of lords had appointed a committee to discuss ecclesiastical innovations with a bishop in the chair the scots commissioners in london were working against episcopacy and there was a strong and growing feeling that scots had no right to meddle the london citizens might present petitions against episcopacy in their best apparel but many felt and one member said that a parody in the church must lead to a parody in the commonwealth it was thus clear that if pym and his party put the church question in the front rank the unanimity against the king would be at an end they did so nevertheless there was therefore a considerable reaction in favour of charles at the end of sixteen forty one he had given way to all demands he had surrendered his old advisers he had gone to scotland with no bad effect on the english army the bishops were not without their supporters the scots were not everywhere popular and there was a feeling that the lads at newcastle had been the mainstay of the rapid parliamentary success since october sixteen forty the commons precipitated a split on religion by an ordinance september sixteen forty one against the laudian ceremonies and the sunday sports the lords replied by ordering the services to be conducted in accordance with the law of the land this gave charles a chance and he seized it he took up this attitude of obedience to law and announced that he would maintain the church as in elizabeth's day but charles never knew how to play his own game even when he had winning cards an event in scotland increased the suspicions of parliament the incident as it was called arose from a quarrel among the scottish nobles montrose was opposed to the democratic form of government for which covenanters under argyle were striving hamilton was intimate with argyle and montrose offered to prove him a traitor a plot was formed by certain other nobles to arrest and carry off hamilton and argyle and it was rumoured that charles was concerned in it this was not at all likely but his motives in going to scotland were suspicious 
and it was believed in england that some such attempts were contemplated against english leaders parliament voted for itself a guard to be placed round the houses though members who were estranged from the majority on church matters ridiculed this alarm it was clear that the split in parliament was complete and that charles would have a party to depend upon and a cause to maintain the irish rebellion which broke out in sixteen forty one attended with horrible massacres of protestants brought matters to a head it was at once said that charles and the queen were concerned in this rising of roman catholics against protestants there was immediate need of action to suppress it parliament had been taking upon itself to issue ordinances without royal sanction during charles's absence and now sent to scotland to tell the king that unless ministers approved by parliament were appointed they would be compelled to take measures for the safety of the kingdom without him this was a revolutionary challenge distrust had culminated in an ultimatum what would be the attitude of the non-puritan party this was soon to be tested the situation was clear the parliamentary leaders unable to act with the king in a reformed government had given him the choice of acting with them or being neglected such a situation was at once seized by pym in the grand remonstrance this restated all past grievances from the accession of charles and concluded with a fresh demand for ministers whom parliament may have cause to confide in it was a bold appeal to the nation against the king the remonstrance was carried by the narrow majority of eleven and the split in the long parliament was complete charles had now returned from scotland where he had recklessly yielded to demands without obtaining a party on his side once in london he set to work to court popularity made a foolish speech at the guild hall referring to his favour with all but the lower classes and withdrew the guards of the house of commons in his answer to the remonstrance he took his stand on the strict letter of the law he would support government in church and state as it was established this gave no security for that parliamentary control over the king's ministers upon which pym and his followers were set how far suspicion carried the constitutional leaders may be seen from the fact that their next step was a bill to transfer to the houses a share in the control of the militia the only armed force known to the ancient law charles did his best to justify these suspicions by appointing a notorious bravo called lunsford to the most important military post in england the command of the tower yet a moment after he cancelled the appointment in deference to the outcry it caused the bishops who had been mobbed on their way to the house protested against the legality of all that took place in their absence and charles approved their action there was a motion in the lords that parliament was not free and there was a fear that the king would repudiate his past concessions and punish the parliamentary leaders finally charles made the blunder of impeaching five members of the commons and one peer for endeavouring to subvert the fundamental laws of the realm to deprive the king of his power and to alienate the affections of the people from him it was quite illegal to do this as the king cannot impeach but charles went further when the impeachment failed he made the irreparable mistake of going himself to the house with an armed retinue and trying to seize the persons of the five members pym hampton hollis hazelrig and strode warned in time they had left the house and charles had to retire amid cries of privilege the king had put himself hopelessly in the wrong the militia question now became a real one parliament was disinclined to admit any power in the king to call out the local forces of the country and demanded that all fortresses and the militia should be confided to men whom it could trust this charles would not grant and an ordinance for the disposal of the militia was drawn up by parliament men were named in each county to train and order the force this was finally agreed to by both houses and the king had already decided to retire from london it was evident that both sides were now preparing for war the parliament had the courage of its convictions and as charles would not act with the leaders they took measures for the defence of the kingdom hull was ordered to be guarded the port of portsmouth was closed the tower was besieged and the magazines all over the country were secured <laughs> 
the question now was whether any one would fight for a king who had proved the suspicions entertained of him to be well grounded appeal was made to the nation by both parties during the early months of sixteen forty two in a series of vigorous manifestos charles took his stand on his legal power as king he would not be swaggered into any more concessions he would maintain the church intact though he signed a bill for removing bishops from the house of lords but there was also the divine right of himself and his family he would not give up the power he was born unto nor prejudice the inheritance of his successors this was a strong position it attracted all those who feared democratic government who loved the church or who believed it a sin to rebel against the will and person of the king if charles solved the problem of sovereignty by an appeal to his pedigree it was impossible for the parliamentary leaders now that they had gone so far to stop their own solution to which they had been gradually led was a startling challenge to the kings they claimed to be the interpreters of the national will to which the king's will must finally bend he was an officer not a despot the kingdom was not his property but only the sphere of his trusteeship the judgment of parliament they declared is the king's judgment though the king in his person be neither present nor assenting thereunto there remained no solution but war which began with a series of races for the possession of the local magazines of arms that of hull for instance hull was moreover a strong post in a loyal district within easy reach of scotland charles on demanding admission was met by the answer that hull could only be open to those who possessed the king's orders signified by parliament here was the new theory put into practice parliament issued the militia ordinance and began assembling trained bands in london the paper war to which reference has been made came to a head on june second sixteen forty two when the nineteen propositions were presented to the king at york they placed him in the position of a figurehead to the constitution and were by his friends called articles of deposition charles replied by issuing commissions of array and began to assemble troops the earl of essex a taciturn soldier with a stern sense of duty some experience and not a spark of genius was made general of the parliamentary forces true to their conception of sovereignty the leaders raised soldiers who were to live and die with the earl of essex for the defence of his majesty and parliament the king's standard was hoisted at nottingham on the twenty second of august sixteen forty two the cause of the civil war has been much in dispute was it a religious or a political struggle the answer is clearly that it was both the gradual sundering of king and parliament as the various questions arose has been shown the question of government was insoluble because every moment the breach between the two theories of the constitution grew wider there was no compromise possible but the nation might have found a better way had there been no religious severance puritanism and its organization had been used as an engine to coerce the king and thus his party was made possible let religion be our primum quirite said a speaker in november sixteen forty the question of government and sovereignty had however been the real one and religion had served to accentuate differences which might otherwise have been almost unnoticed his majesty's will as expressed by parliament was in conflict with his majesty's will as expressed by himself and this difference was rightly placed in the forefront of the parliamentary programme the question of religion was to regain its importance and provide the enthusiasm with which cromwell and fairfax would beat the king when their less zealous friends the mere political reformers had grown tired of fighting for a cause which they did not understand End of chapter four